2019 called Nobody Wants to Hear Your New Song because, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good song too, by the way. Welcome to the Exploring Washington State podcast. Here's your host, Scott Cowan. All right, I'm. Uh, we're gonna, Steve. We hit the button here, so we're live. And my guest today is Steve Element. Um, Steve, thank you for uh, trying to work through technology challenges with me. But I appreciate you're here today. Happy and to be here. Uh, yeah. So, Steve, I'll just say how I am aware of you. I, I, we've met a few times. I can't say we know each other real well, but you used to play with Steve Pearson and Mike Wansley and back in the day and abandoned Tacoma or at least, you know, from Tacoma, no cheese, please. And the Yanks, and you've got a long, long musical career, but I'd like to talk about what you're doing nowadays first. And we'll go nostalgia. So can you share with our guests kind of what's going on in your world right now? Yeah. Well, right now um, I'm putting a new act together. Um. Okay. A trio, actually, acoustic trio, and we got um, eight shows lined up for the summer, starting at the end of June. And um, it, the trio is uh, a woman I've been singing with. Her name is Annie O'Neill. She's remarkable. Uh, plays a little guitar and sings beautifully. Bart Hyde, who I think you know, Bart. I who, do. Uh, Bart. And I've been playing together since uh, forever. Like and, grade school? <laughs> well, not that forever, but <laughs> since college days. Okay. And, All right. um, so we're putting this acoustic act together and working on the songs. And most of the songs, well, you know, Annie picked half of the songs. And I picked the other half of the songs because we're the two singers. So. Um, and right now we're in rehearsal, working this out because the show's coming up in two weeks. Okay. So, uh, I've been doing that on the performance side. Um, you know, I still have the, I still have this rock and roll band that, that we were going by the name Albro Swift Exit, um, mm -hmm. and that's still happening. But it, as you mentioned before we went live uh, with COVID, you know, the, the opportunities to play just evaporated. Um, we did play two times. We did a, a live stream from uh, this really great stage in Port Townsend. We did two of those. Um, okay. But right now, uh, I'm concentrating on the trio thing. But you know, if someone offered us a gig, or you know, we'd have to, we'd have to go and rehearse and start pretty much start over because we haven't played since October. But. Okay. Um, you know, I'm kind of excited about this new thing. I really like to sing. I really love singing harmony and singing with Annie O'Neill is amazing. And she sang on my last three, uh, last four singles. She sang on uh, Armadillo Tattoo. She sang on um, Up Until Now. She sang on uh, the one I just released, which is kind of a country song called Those Little Things. And uh, she sang on another one, which is going to come out July 4th. And that one's called, um, what is that one called? Wishes Don't Come for Free. Okay. So, um, the, and those are all the songs that I've released uh, in the last, you know, four or five months. Um, I have been pretty much concentrating on, you know, songwriting and putting out singles. Some people ask me, why do I do singles? Um, why not do an album? Well, I wrote a song 2019 called Nobody Wants to Hear Your New Song because, <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good song too, by the way. And, uh, you know, I just think albums right now, if, if, I, if you handed your friend an album that you just made and said, hey, go listen to this, Jesus, you know, you're asking them to invest 45 minutes with you, right? Right. And I think today when everyone's so oversaturated and there's so much music coming out, what is it, like 60,000 songs a day on Spotify? 
What? Um, yeah, it's something crazy. It's it's crazy. I had no idea. Yeah, you just. Uh, I think it's just asking too much of people. I mean, you know, even listen to my single every month or every. Now I'm kind of more every sixty days or so on releases. It's just asking too much of people. Okay. That's one thing on the on the listener side. On on my side, um, it's intimidating to me to think, oh my God, I gotta come up with 12 songs and I gotta come up with 12 and then record them and then release that whole batch of 12, you know. I just feel like by the time I wrote the 12th song, um musically, lyrically, I'm somewhere else already. So you know, singles for me, they come into my head. I write them, I record them, I release them. Boom, there it goes. Let's do another one, you know, and I just wait for another song to come and land on me and work on it and do it and, and put it out. And, you know, my, I guess the style of my songs, I don't know if you've listened to them lately, but, you know, I, they're sort of, have. they shift around, you know, because it's, I, I don't really think about, Oh, I'm a rock and roll guy, so I'm only going to write and record rock and roll songs. You know, I just don't think about it that way. I think more about it like, here's a song, and how does it feel? This is definitely a country song, right? Or this is this is a, ba- a slow ballad, or this is a waltz, or you know. So I just let it go like that, and it it seems to be working. And I, I guess the other thing is, you know, if you have to put twelve songs out. Unless you're the Beatles, three or four of them are going to be marginal songs. You know, you might have three or four good ones. I mean, when's the last time you bought an album? Well, (laughs) nobody buys albums anymore. But think about the last time you got an album and you were like, oh, there's two really good songs on it and the other ones are garbage. Well, you know, what's funny is that I, I have this romantic, you've just debunked something for me. I have this romantic notion of the album. Like I'm going to listen to it in its, in its entirety and I'm going to enjoy it like I did when I was much younger. And I don't listen to music that way anymore. You're absolutely correct. I I listen to, I pick and choose. I build a playlist on Spotify or wherever. And that's that's how I consume music. So, but I still have this rom- I. I think maybe the only album that I can think of off the top of my head that I enjoy, I still listen to from start to finish is, is dark side of the moon. I mean, and that I think has, to, in my opinion, I have to play that in its entirety, but I don't do that very often anymore. I've listened to it enough through the years. That, very rarely am I in the mood for dark side of the moon anymore. Yeah. And dark now moon. versus when you, when you like were in the Yanks, you didn't really have the ability to just release a single to the public because the technology wasn't available. Like, it is now where you can find some inspiration, put pen to paper, if you will, lyrics, music together, go to the studio, make it the way you want it to be, and then release it to the world on, I'll just keep saying Spotify is the placeholder. Um, yeah, that that's the way it works, you know? Yeah. And, and so. you know, you mentioned Dark Side of the Moon. Um that was a golden era, you know, where, where people would listen to albums start to finish. And mm-hmm. they didn't have shuffle back then, right? Now they have this thing called shuffle. You cannot shuffle Dark Side of the Moon. You fuck it no. all up. Yes. You, you can't shuffle thick as a brick. Right. Right? Yeah. No, so, I agree. Yeah, yeah there's just it's just some of that. So um well, let me ask you this because I'm I'm not a I'm not a musician. <clears throat> I can't carry a tune, anything. And and the question I'm going to ask you is I'm I'm oversimplifying a complex question, I believe. But what is your what? How do you get from like wh- when the, you said earlier the the song lands on you when you when you get that I'll call it flash of inspiration. What's the process for you? How do you work through that? to getting to something that you finally decide is release worthy. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes, uh, I think more often than not, uh, something will come to me at night, like a dream, or I'll just bolt up in bed and 
or some kind of phrase in my head. And then I can run down here to my office where I'm speaking to you now, and um, I'll jot it down. And I got this book, if you could see it, it's called Dope Rhymes. And Dope Rhymes, okay. I just start writing these phrases or these ideas into this book. And um, sometimes the ideas, you know, are fairly well developed and you can write the song down really quick. And mm -hmm. a lot of the music sort of falls into place. Other times, um, you know, I'll just be strum, have my guitar here and I'll be playing and some chords come together that sounds good. And then I'll run to the book. So that's the other way around, right? Okay. I've got a melody and some chords coming up off of this guitar. And I'll go in this book and I'll start looking for that lyric idea that I had before and just kind of run with it. Like, you know, this new song, Wishes Don't Come For Free. I mean, uh, that just was lyrically... 90% done before I picked up a guitar. It was, it was like, now, how's this song going to go? How does, how do these songs, how do these words fall together? And, uh, you know, so I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's never quite, I always start with the music part or I always start with the lyric part. It's never like that. It's usually a little bit of both or one or the other, but I will say lately it's been more, successful when I've got some, some good lyrics to work with. Okay. Yeah. And then when you take it, you, you kind of got it, you know, pieced together, if you will. When you, you take it in, do you, sh you do you go share it with Bart? Like use him as an example. And does he, or how do you go about bringing the musicians in to help you? Or are you doing all, are you doing everything yourself right now? Or does it matter? I mean, do, um, does it, do you change around? Well, Bart's my main first share, I would say. Okay. Um, what I do um, is I've got some software called GarageBand. Yep. And what GarageBand is, basically, it's a little multi-track studio on your Mac. Yeah, or your iPad. You could take it to bed and play with it on the iPad. Yeah, I've like, never wow. done it on the iPad before. It's even on your phone, but I can't figure out how to make it work. But... You know, and then, so I've got GarageBand. I've got this device over here. It's called the Focusrite, which is the interface for a guitar and a microphone that goes into GarageBand. I can pull mm -hmm. this microphone right. I got a microphone right here like you do. Not as fancy mm -hmm. as yours. Just a, a Sure Beta 58. I got a keyboard over here on my right. I got three guitars behind me. And I'll sit with GarageBand. I'll get a GarageBand drummer, find a rhythm, and start maturing the idea and then once i have honed it a bit so that you know i'm comfortable sharing it with somebody because you want to mm -hmm. share garbage with somebody here's the here if you like this garbage see if you can figure out something that would sound good with <laughs> so, you know i try to figure it out so at least it's a pretty much a whole song structure wise that then i can take put it on garage band and i upload it to SoundCloud and I say, Bart, what do you think of this? Or generally it's Bart and Perry Morgan, who's okay. been a drummer with me. Um, and lately too, I've been sharing a lot with Lee Gregory because I just love his playing, his piano playing and his organ playing. And so, you know, I'll send it to the guys, what do you think of that? And they, you know, usually if I'm sharing it, I'm fairly confident in the song and they'll come back and they'll say, yeah, that sounds good. What about this? Or, you know, how, how are you feeling the guitar? And, um, and then we start, you know, sort of catch ball and the idea, but I will say this, you know, with Perry, with Lee, uh, with Bart, I don't have to give them very much direction at all. They, whatever you're feeling, play it, you know, and, and we start bringing it in, into GarageBand first. Okay. And then we, we kind of got it and we're digging it. Then um, what we'll do is um, Bart and Perry and I will go into a rehearsal studio and we'll just spend, you know, two, three hours just getting the arrangement and 
being ready to go in the studio because you don't mm-hmm. want the studio half baked. It's a waste of money. Right. So we get it really as tight as we can get it. Then we go into the studio and record it. And then we farm it out to other players like Lee because, you know, Lee's got his keyboards all at home and he's got uh, Pro Tools at home. And more and more of the guys I'm playing with have Pro Tools or GarageBand or, or these home uh, devices where we can record and collaborate. And they put their parts in. And then um, we take it down to the studio and do the, the real singing, you know, because mm-hmm. I think it's important to have really good proper mics for getting the vocals. And, um, and then sometimes, you know, we might have a, a performance like, you know, on a few of these songs I've had this pedal steel player come in He's not set up to record at home, so we got to bring him into the studio and do it that way. So, and that's Mark, right? You use Mark? Yeah, you know him. I do know him. Yeah, we. Uh, um, Such a badass. Yeah, I, I, I first. Well, it's really weird. I, I had a conversation with because he's playing. Well, so you actually had a role. Sorry to interrupt you, but I guess I will. I already did. So, I'll, you shared something on your Facebook wall, uh, a video. I don't know, a month ago. Maybe a little more than that. Yeah. And at this video, I was like, oh, this looks cool. So I clicked play and it was a sweet thing in the stumblers. Yeah. And I'm like, this is, this is cool. And so thank you, Steve, for opening that door. And so I reached out to the band and I ended up talking to Troy Moss initially. And then um, they were going to, we were going to try to coordinate. It's kind of hard to coordinate a band to be all together at the same time. So I ended up having a, a conversation with Terry Moss, his wife, the singer, and with Mark. and. Mark went to central at the same time that I did. Didn't, didn't know that. Um, he knew a lot of the same people that I knew. So I don't know how I didn't connect with him through college. And then, you know, he was playing uh, pedal steel with the twang junkies with Pat Boyle and right. uh, Johnny Fox and all those guys. So I've seen him play with those guys. So then I thought I saw that, yeah, he was playing pedal steel on something with you and he's a great player. He's, I like listening to him. He's awesome. He's a banjo player too. Yeah, I did not know that until we went and saw them. We got to see live music for the first time in over a year in Puyallup a few weeks ago. And we went and saw them play on a Thursday. And yeah, he's playing banjo. I, I did not know that. That was kind of cool. Yeah. So anyway, I sorry, I hijacked you. Yeah, well, anyway, I, I mean, I think that's, uh, you asked, how's the process? How do we get from song to finished, mm. recorded and released song? That's that's pretty much it, you know. And then I upload them through. I use DistroKid. Some people use CD Baby. Some people use something else. I use DistroKid, and okay. uh, it gets it out to you know 150 online stores and streaming services. And there you go. So let me ask you this question: So recording in 2021, and say recording in 1985, do you enjoy the process more now with the technology that you have? Or did you, did you much more? Or how was it back in the day when you were in the studio and we had like tape and things Terrible. like that? Terrible compared really? to today. Okay. I mean, uh, there were so many constraints with tape. How much tape do we have left? God, do we have more tracks? We need more tracks, you know? Oh, well, we got to bounce something down if we want more tracks. God, do we have the, you know? Uh, and everything had to be done in the studio, so it was more expensive. Mm-hmm. The mixing and the editing uh, with today's tools is just so much faster. It blows your mind and so much more versatile. The things you can do because of the technology, uh, you know. I would never go back to that uh, analog Okay, 24-track, uh, two-inch tape. God, that tape owner, how much that stuff costs now? It must cost 300 bucks a reel or more. It may be, if you could get it, maybe even. I don't know. Okay. So, yeah, I'm enjoying it much more now. And, and there's a it, lot it of does, people, it, people that say, oh, analog, it sounds so much better. It's so much, you know. Um, maybe if you're playing it through a $10,000 stereo in someone's house, you can maybe hear the difference. But for most people on most average equipment, people's cars uh it's really hard to tell the difference you know well, well and the other another thing about it, it sounds like to me that 
it's it allows you to go from nugget of idea, a seed to a finished composition much faster. And I think, does that not help fuel creativity when, when you're in that creative flow and you're like, you know, I, I don't know. I, to me, I think I I'm your answer doesn't surprise me. I think today is probably a better world for, for being creative with music because you know, garage band or insert name of any other uh, tool that's available to a musician is it's just amazing. Yeah. You, you did something and this wasn't, this isn't about you. Well, you played on it, but Owen Masterson. Yeah. Just, I just saw on Facebook today that you guys kind of did a, well, you were part of this, I'll call it a project. Maybe I, you'll correct me, but, but you guys all recorded that without ever being in the same room, correct? Over Never the last in the few same room. Yeah. He was in Palm Springs. Bart <laughs> okay. Coma. Jeff was in Federal Way. Deborah, uh, she lives down there, not in Palm Springs proper, but down in that area, but they weren't together. Okay. Um, she's the Romeo Void girl, by the way. You know that? Deborah. I, oh, I did not know that. I might have liked you better if we slept together. Yeah. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, none of us. Wow, that's a song room. I haven't heard in a long time. And, and you know, I mentioned that uh, we're doing this trio now, mm -hmm. and we're rehearsing for it. And we sit there and look at each other because we have never, you know, all of these songs since the pandemic that I've written, we've never been together to play them live. You follow me? I do. So, when we got, we're rehearsing down in my uh, basement. And we, when we got down there, we're just kind of looking at each other like, wow, <laughs> how does this song go? We never played <laughs> together before, right? Play the recording. Okay. Well, we've got to have the recording down there. We listen to it. Oh, yeah, that's what we did, right? Oh. So <laughs> it's completely strange to take the pandemic recordings and then rehearse them for live performance, especially you've got to interpret them for an acoustic performance too, right? Because mm -hmm. that's a different trip. You, you've got to treat the song differently. Uh, okay. So we're going through that. You know, tell you what, getting 34 songs together, it's tough. Really. So you, you guys are, I saw that you're playing at McMinimins in Bothell and in De the McMinimins in Tacoma. Um. Yeah. I've seen you play. I saw you play with Steve Pearson one time at McMinimins and Bothell at the, was it the Anderson school? Yeah. That's the name of it. Same place. And is that, are you guys going to be playing at the same, is it going to be the outdoor place that you're playing it's at? Outdoor unless it rains. And if it rains, they move it into a place called the Thorndike room. Okay. So no matter what weather wise, cause it, it, that's in later this month. Um, and in Seattle, it could be snowing for all we know. I <laughs> kid. Um, yeah, we so went let's out with uh, with Mick Miniman's. Um, so June, July, and August, we're going to do two Mick Miniman shows each month. Okay. Okay. Friday night Anderson School, Saturday night Spanish Ballroom. We're doing okay. that in June. We're doing that in July. We're doing that in August. And it was very nice of Mick Miniman's to accommodate me on that because um i mean you can just imagine you know if you have a show in june and then you don't have another show again for three weeks you know you're you've just got to rehearse a lot more so when you can go back to back we can rehearse like hell for friday night carry all mm -hmm. that performance and all that energy into the saturday show right and mm -hmm. it and so that's the idea. And then we got a few other shows too. We're playing uh, two shows down in uh, Renton at the Maplewood Golf Course. And then we're playing at, uh, it's not booked yet, but I'm pretty sure we're going to be playing some shows on Lake Washington at the, the Hyatt in Renton. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Oh, so we'll see where else, you know. I like this acoustic thing, you know. I like to just have my acoustic bass and bard on acoustic guitar, any on guitar and we're just singing and playing. It's just fun as hell. You know, 
Well, and, and isn't that what it's supposed to be fun? Yeah. I mean, okay. something I always like to ask my guests and in, in, in your case, and we're, we'll come back to your earlier music here, but so a question, and I'll let you, you can answer it right away or like you, you can think about it. So two part question in Washington state, cause this is all about Washington state. And I know you played lots of other places, but Washington state, is there one place that you've played that you think is pretty like, is there one place that's really special to you to play? The flip side to that is when you go listen to music, is there a venue that you like to go and see performers perform at? Hmm. And it can be just for fun. It doesn't have to be like you could, I could jokingly say, you could say the ranch tavern in Ellensburg. That will be acceptable. It burned even though it's, Yeah, I know that's the whole point, but so like some of those old venues in back in the day in, in Seattle or uh, Tacoma, I'm just curious where you like, like where's a cool venue that you played at throughout your musical or, you know, at some point in your musical career. Yeah. Well, back in, in Seattle and back in those days, I think Astor Park was a really good place to yeah. see a band because the sight lines were perfect, mm -hmm. but, you know, the old saying, yeah, there's a bad seat in the house. There wasn't. Right. No, that was a great place. And uh, the sound system was good. Sounded good in there. So that was a fun place. Um, okay. Around here these days, like, you know, there's certain rooms that just sound good. One of them is mm -hmm. called the Hotel Albatross in Ballard. Okay. Lots of wood. It's all wood. Uh, and it just sounds beautiful in there, especially with the, an acoustic show. All right. Uh, same with the Sorrento Hotel, believe it or not, up on Capitol Hill. That uh, that place, yeah, acoustically is amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, I've played a lot of places. That it's a, the question you ask is part of it is like as a listener. So mm -hmm. I mentioned those as a performer. Um. Yeah. Well, I liked that that Spanish ballroom in Tacoma is amazing. Okay, I have not seen that yet, so I was going to ask you. Well, it good room? Oh God, you got to Google it. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Okay. And then uh, I do like these outdoor shows at McMenamins because people just have such a good time. You know, they're drinking and they've got fire pits going and. So yeah. for, for the kind of acoustic stuff I'm doing now or what I was doing with Jack Johnson and Danny Blaine, uh, that's a nice venue. I love yeah. playing at Slim's, especially outdoors at Slim's, Last Chance in Seattle. Uh-huh. Um, but, you know, I played – I've probably played every room in Seattle, so. Right. No, so I love asking this question because there's been repeat answers. I mean, you – you, you didn't say the triple door, the triple door has been mentioned, you know, multiple times by people and there's no wrong answer. I mean, you know, it's a people, person's opinion. I, I should like, I should be like going back and listening to the episodes and creating a, a spreadsheet and seeing what, what rooms rank, if you will. Well, I've never I just, played, I've never played the triple door. You've never played. Have you ever seen a show there though? Yeah. And did you like, a sh did you like, did you think the room was a good room? Uh, yeah, I thought the room was a good room. The one band that I saw there last time, they were so terrible. I hated the show. So, okay, I won't mention them, but that, that's yeah, we don't. They were horrible. But, and and see, and that definitely impacts one's opinion of the of the room. Yeah. So let me ask you this question: You, you said you played a lot of venues, and you have. Is there a venue in Washington State that you haven't played that you'd like to play? Triple Door. Okay. I like to play there. Uh, okay. Oh, where else? I don't know. Well, I've never played at the Tractor Tavern. That's a pretty cool place. You've never played the Tractor? No. I'm surprised by that. I know. I am too. Now I'm trying to think. Did I jump up on stage with somebody sometime? Well, it's not a very high stage. So you could have easily jumped. Yeah. Well, <laughs> maybe 10 years ago. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would be a cool room to play. Uh, All right. But I haven't. Yeah. Okay. So I'd like to go back a little bit. So you 
you're from Tacoma, right? If I remember correctly, or no, you're from kind of from Renton, but you went to school, college in Tacoma. Yeah, I was born in. So I think of you as a Tacoma guy. I was. So I, I know. Don't hold that against and me. And I think of myself as a Tacoma guy musically because musically I grew up in Tacoma. Okay. You know, I was born in Renton. I went to Renton High School. I uh, was raised up in a place called Skyway, which is uh, technically Seattle, but it's close to Renton. Close to Renton. And, uh, and then I went to university in Tacoma. And that's where I first started, like, seriously, uh, you know, getting into bands. And So who was your, who was your first band? Uh, like real band, yeah, real band, or a goof around band when you're a kid. No, real band. My first real band was uh, No Cheese Please. I would say. Okay. All right. And then what I know, then the story would go from there. You went to the Yanks. Or am I missing something? Yeah, from there I I I went to San Francisco. I auditioned for the Yanks, and I told myself if I get this gig, I'm going, and I got it, and so I just. Moved, quit everything. Okay. And went to San Francisco and threw myself in full into the music business, you know? And how was that for you? How Did you enjoy that? Oh, it was great. I mean. Okay. Lived in North Beach. Played, oh, you did? Oh, okay. Played in a great band, toured, made records. I mean, it was great. Uh, everything was great except for, you know, breaking up. Okay. That wasn't great, but look, all bands eventually break up except for the Rolling Stones. Yeah. I, I don't know quite how they lasted. I mean, yeah. anyway, we could go down that rabbit hole. Yeah. So Yanks was phenomenal. Uh, probably, you know, best band ever played it. Great player. Okay. Jesus. Paul's all on drums. Jack Johnson on guitar. Owen songwriting machine. Uh, so I was real happy to be part of it. What brought you back up to Washington then? Well, the band broke up. Uh, and the, our management tried to keep uh, us together, me and Jack and mm-hmm. Paul. And, you know, if they fished around for another player to bring in and uh we had the keyboard player from sammy hager's band and that didn't work out and we had paul davis from bonnie hayes and the wild combo and great player but you know you can't have there's not enough oxygen on stage for two guitar players like jack johnson and paul davis okay you know they're both too amazing they get in each other's way so um what happened then was that uh, the you know the Flame and Groovies. I I know the name. So the Flame and Groovies, we we rehearsed at the same place in the Mission, and Paul was playing drums with the Groovies and the Yanks. And when the Yanks broke up, when Cyril in the Flame and Groovies, he had a tour to Europe and then to Australia, and uh, so he needed a drummer and a guitar player. So he, since he knew us, you know, he got Jack and Paul and they went on tour. They said, Hey, we'll be back in about six months and, you know, we'll carry on with this. Well, I didn't want to wait around six months is a long time, especially in band land, you know, six months, someone comes back and then, okay, then there's another six months of, Let's get some material together. And then there's another three or four months of let's record, let's release. And I mean, there there goes two years of your life, Mm -hmm. you know, like that. So at that point, I kind of had enough. I was uh, at that age where I thought, fuck this music business, you know, getting out of here. So I came back to Seattle and uh, got a real job. Okay. Okay. but then Steve Pearson calls me and he goes, uh, he goes, Hey, let's get a band going. And I was like, <laughs> get out of here. You know, don't talk to me about bands. I don't want to be in a band anymore. You know? 
and he was still doing the range hoods, right? Mm -hmm. And he's a very clever guy because then he says to me, yeah, 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 bad, yeah, bad idea, bad idea. He goes, why don't we just get together and write some songs? And I go, okay, <laughs> we could do that. You oh, fell for it. No harm there. Yeah, he was just <laughs> reeling me in, right? Uh -huh. So he would come over to my, I had a house in West Seattle and Steve would come over. We go down in the basement and, you know, next thing we know, we had 10, 13 songs, which is enough for a set. Right. Which, you know, these days that still these days it, in the bar band scene, you get a set, you get 50 minutes or an hour. That's it. So uh, here we had those songs and we're playing them. And he goes, man, these are pretty good songs. He goes, Pete. A shame if no one ever heard these songs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and he just kept reeling me in. And he goes, uh, he goes, maybe we should, you know, try them with the band. I go, I don't know any, you know, I don't. He goes, I know a drummer and uh, he's really good. His name's Jeff Kathan. And uh, I go, well, who's going to play the other guitar? He goes, you're going to play it. I go, no, I'm a bass player. He goes, no, I think you're a guitar player in this band. And I know this guy, Mike Wansley, uh, uh, he'll be the bass player. He had it all worked out. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> and so the next thing I know, we're ensconced in a rehearsal studio on Harbor Island. And I meet Mike Wansley and Jeff Kathan for the first time. And, well, I'm not, I actually had met Wansley uh, when Yanks were on tour. We played at the ranch in Ellensburg. Okay, and I think his uh, he had a band and they opened for us, right? Yeah, I forget their name. Boys will be boys, or something. boys will be boys, boys to men or something. Yeah, boys to men. <laughs> no, boys will be boys. Okay, so yeah, yeah so then that we started that band, the Fighting Cox. Right. Okay. I, I I've heard I've heard a, a the other side of that story. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, Pearson Pearson pretty much said it exactly like you did. He did. I kind of reeled him in. <laughs> yeah, I kind of reeled him in. <laughs> he reeled me in totally. And then when, oh my you know, the Fighting Cocks, uh, we did some recording. We did some, uh, I think, two demos. The second one was Howard Lease produced from Heart. Okay. We did it up at Robert Lang Studio and um, shopped it around to labels. People were still doing that then. And uh, <laughs> no one bid on it. And, it, and I just... It, after a while, I was just like, oh, God, you know, all right, you tricked me into this. No more. And uh, so I decided I didn't want to be in the fighting cocks anymore. And then uh, Pearson calls me again. I don't know how many months later and says, hey, uh, I need a bass player in the Range Hoods. And we got a gig like tomorrow at the Ballard Firehouse. I need you to play. And I was like, I don't even know all your songs, you know. Don't worry, I'll show them to you. So he comes over and just crammed, you know, all night. <laughs> learn 15 Range Hood songs. And, uh, and so I was just supposed to be filling in for right. Runsley, actually. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up filling in for Wansley and the Range Hoods for about four years. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. So then what did you do after that? I moved to Europe. Okay. I, I So I'll tell you what I've heard. You know, I heard when Wansley played with Macklemore and they toured Europe, he saw you. Um, he, he, I think you guys went out to dinner is what I heard. So that's how I knew you had ended up in Europe. Yeah. Well, how did you like living in Europe? I loved it. Wansley, uh, he texted me or emailed me from somewhere. He was on the road mm -hmm. with Macklemore. He goes, Hey, we're in Munich and I'm staying at this hotel. And, uh, you know, if you want to go to the show, I got tickets and da da da. And uh, I go, well, I'm coming over to pick you up. You're coming to my house for dinner. So I went and picked him up and he came over to our house and Denise made dinner and we hung out at my house. And because, uh, you know, when you're on the road, you're not eating that good. No, probably not. Yeah. So he was very happy to have a good home cooked meal. And uh, and then the next day I went to their show, which was at the uh, 
you know, they had the Olympics in Munich in the 70s. And uh, yep. so that's where Macklemore played at the Olympic uh, venue there. And that was good fun. Yeah, I was a, I saw him play it one time in Seattle and uh, it was, it was, it was, it, so I've known Mike, Mike was my co- college roommate. Okay. So I've known Mike 40, 40 years and um, it was really surreal to watch that whole thing unfold um, from, you know, being called at 11 something at night to go, go sing a hook to being on Saturday night live. I mean, yeah. just kind of surreal to watch that. Yeah. Uh, watch I think we were all rooting for Michael. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. So then you came, obviously you're back since we're talking, but you know, so you came back. So you, did you work? Well, am I correct? Did you work for Boeing? I did. I worked for Boeing <laughs> and uh, I went to Europe first for Boeing. I went to Belgium and then I moved to Amsterdam and then I came back to the States and then um, then I got poached from Boeing by a company called Bombardier. Mm-hmm. And they uh, moved me first to Toronto for a little while, Toronto, Montreal, and then uh, to Munich. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So I was over there for 10 years. Yeah, that's, yeah, I've heard that. So um, that'd be pretty fun. I think to live in Europe and be able to not be a tourist, but, you know, actually conduct your life, go to work, do your thing and experience life outside of the United States. I think it'd be, my daughter lives in Austria. So. Oh, what um, part? She lives in a a town called Telfs, which is outside of Innsbruck. It's a little, maybe 10,000 people. Um, I've been many times in Innsbruck. Did you say Tolls? Telfs, T E L F S. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but it's uh, it's maybe 30 minutes out of Innsbruck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, better and, uh, well. Yeah. She she did. Um, uh, she was a notary exchange student. Um, went to Norway. Loved it. Came back. Worked for a not even a year. Saved up her money. Got a job as a nanny in Germany and um, met a guy in Amsterdam. They got married. And, oh wow. There you are. So, you know, so two kids. Probably never coming back. Probably not. She visits, she, she does explore Washington state with me. She handles all her social media and all that. So she, it's, it's great. I get to talk to her every day with technology, you know, you know, it's amazing. You know, when you were in Europe, it was probably expensive to call home and say hi to somebody. Well, we actually uh-huh. had, uh, wasn't it called zoom. It was what was before zoom it was, uh, oh, I can't remember, but yeah. Um, well, Skype, there was Skype, Skype was but Skype. It, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I talked to her more and I talked to my son who, you know, anyway, anyway, it, it, regardless of that. So you're back playing music, you're doing all this stuff, which I think is great. And, um, I enjoy what you've been putting out and what I've been able to listen to. So one of the other things is we always like to ask people. So when you're not doing what you do, and so in your case, when you're not playing music, I know you golf because you share it on Facebook a lot. I'm going to put you on the spot. Best Washington state golf course that you've played. Gamble Sands. Really? Why? I've heard a lot of good things. I'm, I'm, I'm not a golfer anymore. I've seen some great photography from there. It looks like it's a beautiful course. It's just beautiful. It's wild and it's uh, quiet and it's uh, tough, but it's fair. And okay. there's a lot of challenges, you know, playing there, uh, uh, using your imagination. So, uh, and then I just played it about two weeks ago. So it's okay. my so, how, so how good of a golfer are you? Oh, I'm not very good. Uh, okay. Although sometimes I win some money. Okay. Because once in a while I can play way better than my handicap. So what is your handicap? My handicap right now is a 20. Okay. Okay. So you're an, you're a medi- mediocre. I don't mean to insult you, but you're just a, an average I'm golfer. Just an average you're just- Joe golfer that, you okay. know, and I always will be unless I start playing three or f- three times a week, which I do. Okay. You know, I play maybe once a week. Okay. 
And in the winter, I don't play because I refuse to play in the rain, in the cold. I just, you know, so. It's not fun. No. Okay. So Gamble Sands. How about in the Seattle area? What's a great, is there a course in Seattle that's fun? In Seattle, the best course I've played, and probably the best course I, I think most people would agree, was is the Seattle uh, Country Club. Okay. Which is really an experience. Uh, that's really great. Um all right. But it's private, How about, you know, so you got to know somebody who's a member and then yeah, get in there. So how about, is there a course that you haven't played yet that you want to check out? Yeah, I always like to play that course Desert Canyon because it's got a 600 and some yard par five. That's the one that's in Orondo, correct? I think so. Yeah. I was up there to take some photographs and it's... Got pretty nice views of the Columbia. Mm. I didn't know it had a 600 yard par five. Yeah. Downhill. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I, I would hope so. <laughs> and there's another one that I've wanted to play. I, th- I forget where it is, but it has a green on an island. It's in the shape of an apple. So must- That's Yakima. That That's Yakima? in Yakima. Yeah. Yeah. I always wanted to play that just to hit my ball onto that apple. You know, I think that'd be pretty cool. Have you ever, have you ever played Chambers Bay? I have played Chambers Bay and I didn't enjoy it that much. Okay. Um, maybe just because uh, it was a lot of up and down hill. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, I felt like I was playing in a big gravel pit, which well, it was, it was. Playing in a big gravel pit. Yeah, exactly. All right. So what else do you, so Steve, what do you do for when you're not, you're, you're a man of leisure. No, I'm just kidding. Um, what do you, what else do you do for fun and excitement? Where are some places around you that people would should know about that they might not know about? Things about me? No, and no, not you. Things that you do. Is there a is like where's a great restaurant that's maybe off the beaten path? You know, you don't want to give your favorite spot up. And in, in this time of with COVID, maybe they're not open. But like, where's a great place? for dinner in Seattle. Well, now you got me on something. I do enjoy going out for dinner. Um, okay. Certain places, you know, in my neighborhood, there's an Italian place called Vendemia, which is fabulous. It's on 34th in Madrona. Okay. Uh, Brian Clevenger is the chef. He has a couple other restaurants in Seattle. Um, I like a restaurant in Belltown called, um, I guess it's not Belltown, it's more Pike Place Market area, but it's called La Piche. It's a small- I've never heard of that. It's a small okay. French restaurant on first in Virginia. Not right okay. next to the Virginia Inn. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Store. Uh, so that's one of my go-to places. I like the Pink Door a lot too. I like to go there. Sometimes I meet my brother there, have a martini and just eat, eat at the bar. Um, yeah. So many good restaurants in Seattle. I mean, come on. It's hard to, right. Hard to even. Are you, are you a coffee drinker? I drink too much coffee. No, there's no such thing as too much coffee. Oh, well, when my hair starts standing on end, I thought that was a natural condition for hair. I thought it was all supposed to. Stop. Okay. <laughs> Where's a great place for coffee? In my house. Okay. So since mean, you're not, I'm not a let's go out for coffee kind of guy. I don't. Okay. So Starbucks or okay. somewhere like That's that. Fine. Sometimes I do go, uh, like if I go to the Ballard Market, I like to go to that Cafe Umbria in Ballard. Okay. I think they yeah. make pretty good coffee right there. Okay. Um, but I pretty much. So, you know, I drink it at home and I, I try to stay fit and work out every day. So my routine is I, I get up, I'm pretty much, I'm an early riser. I'm usually up by six. Okay. I put on a pot of coffee. I've usually got a book going. So I'll read my book and I'll drink that entire pot of coffee. What's well, a single serving? It's one pot. I mean, it is one. a single serve. Thank you for that. And then I'll... You know, I get really jacked on coffee and then I go up and do my workout, which, you know, the caffeine really propels me into that workout. 
Okay. And uh, by the time I finish that, it's usually, you know, 1130 or so in the morning. And, and then, and then you're on with your day, day. Whatever, I'm, whatever I'm doing that day or if I've got rehearsal or working on songs or uh, if I'm playing golf, I'm not drinking coffee, let me tell you. It messes up the putting. It messes it up. It gives you the yips like you can't believe. So uh, I just have, like this morning, I had one cup of coffee. That just sounds pathetic. It was pathetic. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so what? Uh, what coffee do you like? What? Uh, what do you? What, I, uh, what, I'm gonna at home here. I'm drinking yeah. uh, Pete's Italian Roast. Okay. Solid coffee. It, yeah. And then also we have an Nespresso machine. Mm-hmm. And Denise, my wife, she gets those little Nespresso capsules. Mm-hmm. She likes that. Uh, and sometimes like today when I got back from golf, I popped one of those capsules in and had a, a shot of espresso because I needed it. Yeah. You needed it. Okay. Yeah. Because I only had one cup of coffee this morning. Right. I mean, that's, I don't know how you function. I don't know. How See how, I, <laughs> <laughs> Well, what haven't I asked you that we should share with the audience? Is there anything that we've kind of, you know, let, you know, musically you're starting to play again, you're releasing stuff on a, you know, I don't want to say regular, but you know, three, four times a year, you're putting new music out. No, it's more than Uh, that. I mean, I was releasing uh, starting in 2018 and right through to probably the end of 19, I was releasing one single every month. Every month. So why did you quit? I didn't really quit uh, okay. because I just changed the interval. Instead of every month, it became every month and a half. Okay. Uh, why? Well, I was really holding myself to this one a month discipline. Mm-hmm. And so um, I felt like the schedule was starting to take over the creative process more than it should. All right. And uh, seems, yeah. just like I was saying earlier, you know, if you put out an album, you, you might have three or four good songs on it and four or five mediocre ones and two crappy ones. So mm-hmm. I felt like, you know, I'm going to get off the, the treadmill of one a month and I'm going to put out a song when I got a good song and I'll put it out. And Mm -hmm. instead of one a month, it's been more like every month and a half, which is fine. Um, As long as the songs are good. And that's the other thing about singles. You know, you always. Well, I like to ask other songwriters, but at least for me, it's always like, um, wow, that last song was good. People liked it. It got played a lot on the radio. This next song better be better. Mm. You know, so you're always kind of holding yourself to a. Uh, setting the bar a little bit higher for yourself uh, as mm-hmm. far as the song goes. So I think I'm getting better songs. Um, I think I got some really good songs in that period from middle of 2018 until the end of 2019. I think okay. looking back, there's a few in there that, well, I mean, I, I've made physical CDs, you know, I have, one guy called 150 Tears that I put out in 2020, which really is mm-hmm. a compilation of the singles. But those songs that I thought were sort of marginal, they're not on there. I didn't put them. Okay. So, uh, and I got a new one coming out this month. It's called Armadillo Tattoo. It's got 14 songs on it. And, you know, I I think they're all pretty good songs. And ones that I didn't put any songs on there that I thought that's, that wasn't one of my better songs. I didn't put it on, you know? Okay. Well, so let me ask you this question because I think I've, I've oversimplified something. So I, you know, I, it's not that you just put them on Spotify, Pandora or wherever like that, but you're also, I know you're getting some radio play, like the local with Louise show up in North Seattle on Fridays. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had her on as a guest because she tagged you and I was like, Oh, what's this? And so she was, she's doing a lot to ex- expose Seattle music, which is pretty cool. Where else, how else are you getting, how are you getting your music out there? I mean, beyond putting it on Spotify with, you know, 60,000 songs and it kind of hard to stand out. 
what's the landscape like now for getting your music played? Well, uh, I'm blessed for people like Louise. You know, she you know, she focuses on the local scene. That's mm-hmm. her show local with Louise. And I think she does a great service of sifting through a lot of artists and putting out the stuff that she wants to showcase on her show. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's up to her. You know, you can send her a song. I've, I think I've sent her songs that she never played on her show. That's fine. I mean, you know, yep. she wasn't feeling it. Great. It's her show. I'm glad when she does put them on. Um, I send them to, like, if if I got a good country song, I'll send it to the country DJ at KEXP and he'll play it. Okay. Um, if I have a good, um, most of the internet radio stations are very good about playing my songs. Okay. Um, Locally here, too, K, uh, KBCS is an amazing station, especially those two disc jockeys. Uh, the program director is a guy named uh, Ian Hughes. And mm-hmm. another DJ that I think is really knows music is uh, Judy Lindsay. So between 12 and 7, those two do each do a show, three or four hours long. And they really are into the music, you know, they curate the program and they, they're like serious disc jockeys, like back in the olden days. Okay. And I really like and appreciate both of them. And they've been pretty supportive uh, of my songs ever since that song came out. We can hold out that I did with Kim Byron. Um, They've been adding my songs to their program. So I'm really grateful for that. And then there's, you know, the internet radio stations, I, they'll play everywhere in Spain, in Holland, in uh, England, in uh, Channel Islands. Uh, oh. But, you know, the thing about music these days is it's all become so balkanized. You know, um, back when we were young, everyone listened to the same two or three radio stations. And those two or three radio stations pretty much played the same, you know, 50, yeah, 80%, 80%. Yeah. yeah. So we all were hearing the same thing. And so everybody was into Elvis Costello album or the whoever, you know, now, <laughs> right. um, you know, I get the, I get the chart every week, the real chart, not the fake billboard chart, but this chart is called, um, song revenue chart so this is the chart where all the streaming services report in on what songs they played and how many times they played them and you know okay. people on here that you probably wouldn't even recognize uh their names you know and no, i'm sure i wouldn't and they're the the performers number one on this chart and making three hundred thousand dollars a week on one song and you've never heard of them, right? That was unheard of 30 years ago, even 20 years ago. So, you know, now what happens? I mean, Bruce Springsteen puts out an album, nothing happens. Paul McCartney puts out an album, it flops. Um, so it's just a different, we're just dealing in a different world now where everybody's in their own musical silo, and that's cool. I mean, they all have their own tastes, but uh it's just because we all are, ex- we don't have this common place to listen to music anymore. So people go off on their own. They put their head buns on, they put their playlist on, and that's where they live, right on. So <clears throat> I think I saw an article a while ago. You know, it, it's hard to tell, six months, a year ago. And Bruce Springsteen had just released a, a new album. And it was the number one selling album of the week. And I, th- I want to say that it was like 45,000 units. That's it. Yeah. Cause it's physical. Um, it's physical people, you know, most of that yeah. physical product is CD. And then some of it is, uh, vinyl, vinyl. but the way like this chart, 
I'm looking at it right now. The number one single this week is by an amazing artist named Olivia Rodrigo. You've heard of her, right? I have not. Okay. She pretty much owns this chart. I bet she's got 12 or 13 songs in the top 50 this week. And her number one song is called Good For You. Mm -hmm. And uh, she made... $253,000 $253,000 on streams and she made only $10,000 on sales. And the sales include CDs, vinyl, and downloads. And probably 90% of the sales is downloads. So the CDs and the albums are de minimis. Mm-hmm. I mean, people just, you know, don't, don't buy them. They don't buy them. So does that. Does that chart so, show how many times that, that song was played? Yes, it was played in one week. It was played 44,863,000 times. Almost 45 million plays in a week. In one week. And That's the revenue. I'm having trouble. The revenue for that wow, was $264,000. I love this chart, you know, because people my age are like, Spotify fucked the music business. Stream mm-hmm. ruin the music business, you know. Oh, bitching and moaning as no one wants to buy my up, you know. Hey, if you got a good song, <laughs> people are going to stream it 44 million times, you know. Look at, I look have, at me, for example. You know, I, I'm ha- if I get a song that gets a thousand spins on Sp- Spotify, I'm tickled pink, mm-hmm. you know. 44 million. Wow. So you get this, you get this every week. Yeah. Is that a typical number? Like 44 million? Is that a fairly, is that in the ballpark of normal or is that really high from what you remember? Pretty much, you know, where like the top songs are. Um, I think last week she had even more. She was at number one last week too. And her, I remember her revenue was over 300,000 for that same song. Good for you. So she's made basically, you know, half a million dollars in two weeks off of one in song. In one week. Well, yeah. on that one yeah. song. Well, on, yeah, right. Yeah. On that one wow. song. But remember, I told you, she's got 12 or 13 songs on this show. <laughs> so I had yeah, yeah, revenue yeah. up just for last week, and it was over mm-hmm. $1.7 million. So I guess my point is everybody is bitching about <laughs> Spotify's ruined the music business. Well, you know, no. maybe people just don't dig your music. I, I think, yeah. I, I mean, I have, I kind of have the same feeling. It's like, is, are musicians getting paid? Like, I think people should, if they enjoy music, I think it's great to pay for music. It's it's great to support artists being creative and being artists. And so I, I've had this kind of, notion that I feel almost guilty listening to on Spotify. I had no idea. I had no clue until just five minutes ago when you shared, started sharing these numbers that it was even possible for a musician to make that much money in a year, much less in a week. Oh yeah. There's so much. Wow. More. uh, Now let this sink in. Okay. I'm going to say this and people are going to say that, Bullshit, but it's not. Don't let, but some people don't let facts get in the way of their story in their head. But there are okay. more artists making more money today than ever in the history of the music business. And why? All because of streaming. That's just a fact. You know, it's a pill. People need to swallow it. People bitch and bitch. Nobody's getting paid anymore. No. Guys like you and me were not getting paid because we don't have 44 million streams a, a week. It's just the way it is. People don't want to hear it, but it's true. That's that's fascinating. So, well, listen, I want to respect your time, so I'll wrap this up. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you want to share? And where can people listen to you and find out more about you if they wish to do so? Well, thank you. Um People can listen to my music on Spotify and all the major streaming services. Um, 
also on YouTube, although they pay the worst of all. Really? YouTube's the worst. Okay. They pay the lowest per stream of everybody. Uh, but my music's there, and, I, you know, I just want to get it out there. So, any of that. Sure. So, you know, go go on YouTube, give it a like, make a comment. That's the thing, you know. Most, I think most artists that I know, what do you, you put a song out, what do you want? You want somebody to say, hey, that was pretty cool. Or, or leave a comment, you know, I like that song, I dug that guitar solo, or those lyrics really got me. Um, that's all you want, right? Um, so yeah, check me out. Just Google Steve Alamant and those things should come up. And then if you keep your eye on, uh, Facebook and Twitter and things like that, uh, that's generally the way that I try to get info out about songs and about gigs. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Well, I look forward to, um, seeing you play later this month where I think we're going to, uh, uh, Edie and I are going to, I think we'll probably come over to the Bothell show just cause it's easier for us to drive home at, at night versus Tacoma is a little, little long of a drive home. Yeah. You go right but, over uh, highway too, right? Exactly. But I really want to see, I really want to go to see those McMinnimans in Tacoma because, well, remember the, remember what the Elks Lodge looked like in the eighties. I mean, it was a pit, you know, and it, it was the fact that McMinnimans was able to restore that building and they invested millions of dollars i'm so so happy to see that that building is there and being cared for and used now so i want to go check it out i just haven't gotten there yet so yeah who knows maybe later this summer we'll we'll journey over and see you play uh maybe in july or august um but anyway thank you for making this happen oh, and uh i had a great time i hope you enjoyed yourself and uh i yeah well thanks for being here my pleasure talk to you soon Join us next time for another episode of the Exploring Washington State podcast.